Okay, everybody. Assalamualaikum, everyone. How are you all? Uh, so today we have finally approached towards the last lesson, and um, if we recall back, it was a very unusual semester, isn't it? We started up um, earlier this year, and our main focus while we were uh, studying was to complete everything in a very limited time and we were rushing but as we uh, uh, we we uh, encountered pandemic and everything so that kind of slowed down things and the stuff that you basically had to learn in a period of four months that extended to a period of i think six months uh, you see this is life and uh, the thing is this, we plan something and then something else happens, which is uh, planned by Allah and, uh, you know, it, it was destined. We could never think of online classes, we could never think of online exams or viva or online quizzes or anything, but see, uh, whatever our plans were, they're, they're all kept aside. And look what's happening. See? So the thing is just always be mentally prepared for everything that can, that can happen. And if something happens which is uh, not that you plan for, so the thing is this you should always uh, you know do not lose control over yourself and always be firm enough. Do not let anybody else sympathize with you. Um, yes, sympathy is good that you share the feelings with others and all that, but uh, if, if something God forbid happens, so you should not look forward to get sympathy. Rather, you should develop an action plan how to combat the situation in which you are stuck in. Right, everybody? So, uh, but the, uh, the pro of everything was this. That ANS you studied in uh, like deep detail, and I'm sure in your upcoming years when you study form pharmacology even more, so it will benefit you throughout. So let's start our last last lesson. Okay, so uh, we are starting up uh, with lower GID disorder. Okay, today we are going to cover up like did it, antidiarrheal agents. Agents used in inflammatory bowel disease. When we talk about inflammatory bowel disease, we have two uh, uh, two diseases that we have to cater. That is ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease. Then we have drugs for irritable bowel syndrome. Right, everybody. Okay. So let's talk about the first class, which is Lexated. Like so basically, why do we use Lexadis? Lexadis are used when somebody has constipation, right? So if somebody has constipation, definitely the person would want the stool to get softened up or maybe the peristalsis to happen even more so that the uh, stool can be passed up, right? So the main purpose is there are stool softeners and antidiarrheals that act primarily on the large intestine to promote an increase in the fluid accumulated in the bowl. Now, why large intestine? We are here focusing on large intestine because if you remember uh, physiology of body, physiology of GID, so you should know that in small intestine, uh, basically absorption of minerals and fats, all of that happened, right? Uh, in small intestine, lip fats, glucose and amino acids, they are absorbed, right? When we talk about large intestine, so here, this is the place where reabsorption happens. 
right? Reabsorption of what? Reabsorption of extra water uh, and reabsorption of the minerals which were left behind, right? Okay, so here we have to increase in the fluid accumulated in the gold, right? So you see, when I say in the large intestine, the fluid is being reabsorbed, the water is being reabsorbed. So definitely if I want to soften up the tool, stool, so I want that water reabsorption to happen a bit less, right? So decrease net absorption of fluid from the bowl or alter bowl motility. These actions facilitate the evacuation of fecal material. What is bowl motility? As I said, peristalsis would be even more, so obviously bowl would be uh, evacuated from the body. Now, laxatives should not be used chronically as they may induce laxative dependence. What do they mean by that? For example, you have constipation and instead of um, changing your lifestyle, you start taking laxatives, right? Then eventually your body would be adjusted to for that laxative and uh, the body won't even try to compensate uh, anything, right? So it may cause laxative dependency, right? So types of laxatives, types of stool softeners that we have are bulk forming laxatives, osmotic agents, and when we talk about osmotic agents, here we talk about salt con containing laxatives and salt free laxatives. Then we are going to talk about irritant or stimulant laxatives. And then we are going to talk about stool softeners. So talking about bulk forming laxatives. Here we have to deal with three drugs that can be taken in order to uh, deal with this condition. So the first one is uh, psyllium, then methyl cellulose, and polycarbophyll, right? So these are bulk forming laxatives are poorly absorbed from bowl lumen and retain water in the bowl, right? Uh, when uh, we talk about bulk forming laxative, it means they would increase the content of the stool, right? The increased luminal mass stimulates peristalsis and produce laxation after two to four days. Adequate hydration is required. These agents are treatment of choice for chronic constipation. Okay. But these may cause bloating and flatulence. Flatulence, you all know, is the gases or fart that happens. And when we talk about bloating, so bloating is actually uh, the distended abdomen. You see over here. The thorax region it's being distended okay so this is the uh, this is the physical appearance of bloating okay when we talk about osmotic agents so what is osmotic agent first of all let's talk about it osmos means water okay so when we talk about osmotic agent it means that here by the use of these agents i am going to manipulate water content right Okay, so what, why I, am I using this class? These agents are used for both acute and chronic constipation. Like I just said, that exudives treat constipation. So this is another class for treating constipation. When we talk about salt containing laxatives, the other name for it is saline laxative. Okay, and they include magnesium citrate, magnesium hydroxide and sodium phosphate. So these agents are poorly absorbed ions that retain water in the lumen by osmosis and cause a reflex increase in peristalsis. When we talk about ions, when we talk about salts, so if you know whenever a salt content is increased somewhere, so automatically water from the other region would come to the region where water content is less, right? You can take it as an example, like uh, 
for example, if you take potatoes, okay, uh, so the water won't be there on top of it and everything. It would be a, a bit dry, okay? <coughs> Sorry. But if you sprinkle salt over it, and after two minutes, if you try to touch it, you would feel that they're soggy now. And why they're soggy now? Because the water content moves, okay? So what is osmosis? Osmosis is the movement of water molecules from a region of higher concentration to a region of lower concentration. So here salts are facilitating this action, okay? So these agents are poorly absorbed ions that retain water, okay? In the lumen by osmosis and cause a reflex increase in peristalsis. Salt containing osmotic lexatives are taken orally. Sodium phosphate are also effective rectally. I, I hope you all do remember the first three classes that we took in university where I talked about different modes of administration, different routes of administration. I hope you are revising that. Okay. So onset of action typically occurs three to six hours after oral administration and five to six hours, five to 15 hour minutes after rectal administration. They require adequate um, hydration for effect. Sodium phosphate may cause systemic adverse effects, especially in cases of renal dysfunction. Uh, what is renal dysfunction? Renal dysfunction is when the kidney is not functioning properly. So sodium phosphate would increase the content of phosphate and sodium in the blood. So that's why we are calling it phosphatemia means, emia means blood, right? So that means phosphate is being increased in the blood. Hypernatremia, it means uh, sodium content is increased massively in the blood. Then we have salt-free lexatives. So these include lactulose and polyethylene glycol electrolyte solution. So these agents may be administered practically or orally. And this here, this is the market name for this thing, okay? So it's used for pre-operative colon preparation, right? Whenever you have to treat colon by operation, so you treat it before the procedure. Then we have stool softeners. In stool softeners, we have docusate sodium, glycerin, and mineral oil. So docusate has a detergent action. If you, um, um, if you have studied about uh, emulsions in pharmaceutics, you must know about what is the detergent action, right? They actually mix the water and oil together to form the um, emulsion, okay? So here, this drug is taking the same mechanism, okay? Has this detergent action that facilitates the mixing of water and fatty substances to increase luminal mass. Mineral oil coats fecal content and thereby inhibit absorption of water. Clear everybody? So definitely when something would be coated with the oil, so reabsorption won't happen. But on the other hand, just imagine when it would be covered up with the oil, it means, yeah, yeah, this is of our benefit that water is not reabsorbed. But fat soluble vitamins would also be not absorbed. Right, everybody? So this is the negative aspect of it. Then we have lipoid pneumonia can develop if mineral oil is aspirated. Aspirated means inhaled, okay? So if this mineral oil is inhaled, so any person would develop lipoid pneumonia. Lipoid means accumulation of fats, okay? So fats in the livers would cause, fats in the lungs would cause pneumonia, okay? And you know pneumonia, you have coughing and breathing problem and everything, right? So this is another negative aspect of it. Then we have irritant, which is stimulant negative. Here we have bisecodyl. 
Stena, Cascara, Sagrada. These are the uh, very amazing names, I would say, of these lexatives. Uh, okay. So, irritant lexatives stimulate smooth muscle contraction. Okay. So, just imagine uh, when contraction would be stimulated, so definitely peristalsis would be more. Okay. Resulting from their urgent action on the bone mucosa, local bone inflammation also produces accumulation of water and electrolytes. The increased luminal content stimulates reflex peristalsis, and the irritant action stimulates peristalsis directly. Right? The onset of the action occurs six to twelve hours. These agents require adequate hydration. Chronic use of irritant lexatives may result in um, cataric colon, a condition of colon distension and development of lexative dependence. Uh, first of all, let's talk more about this cataric colon. What is that? Uh, this usually happens in people who are habitual of taking lexatives. Okay, so in that, uh, in their colon, okay, it becomes kind of distended. Okay and um, it becomes ir irresponsible a bit, right? Uh, I want to give you guys a tip. You see, in pharmacology, throughout the years, still you will keep on studying pharmacology, you would always have two things. Mechanism of action, time of onset of, uh, onset of action, duration of action, half-life, and stuff like that. Uh, what I would advise you to do is this at the back of the notebook I want you to draw three to four columns okay or maybe buy a new notebook a smaller one and draw three to four lines okay and whenever you read about a drug and you study like here you are studying onset of action that is six to twelve hours so you keep on noting all of these information in that particular notebook so by end of five years when you would be done with form B you would have all of the drugs that are compiled at one place. That will make your life very much easier. As uh, for example, if you have to give comprehensive exams somewhere, so it will facilitate you in that. Okay. Because in pharmacology, obviously mechanism of action is asked or symptoms are asked and stuff like that. So if you have everything compiled at one place, it will make your life very easy. Then is anti-diarrheal agents. So these decrease a fecal water content by, uh, okay, here, now we are beginning a new class, lymphatives are over, okay? Now we are starting up with anti entire diarrheal uh, agents. So here it means that these are the agents which uh, diminish diarrhea, okay? So when we are saying diarrhea, what is diarrhea? Diarrhea is the excessive loss of water and electrolytes from the body, right? It means here our target would be to uh, reserve uh, electrolyte and water or maybe stop them from getting uh, drained out of the body, right? So to decrease fecal con water content by increasing solute absorption. Uh, Mama, bring my laptop charger. Bah. Okay, so to decrease water content by increasing solute absorption or decreasing intestinal secretion and motility. Okay, wait. Increased transit time facilitates water reabsorption. As I said in my previous slides, uh, that water reabsorption happens in the large intestine, right? Now, just imagine you are increasing the transit time. It means you are increasing the time by which it would take to uh, get evacuated from the body. So definitely water would reabsorb even more, right? So therapy with these agents should be reserved for patients with significant and persistent symptoms of diarrhea. So the content to, for anti-diarrheals would be opioids acting directly on opioids receptor, uh, bismuth salicate, and octreotide. 
So in opioids, uh, we are going to talk about three, three drugs, I think. Okay, the first one is diphenoxylate, then is lopramide. Okay, so there are two drugs which we are going to study. Okay, so the first one is diphenoxylate and its active metabolite, diphenoxin, are used for the treatment of diarrhea and they're not uh, analgesic. Okay, so the uh, diphenoxylate is used as a combination product with atropine uh, to reduce abuse of the drug and at high doses, this agent may produce CNS effect, which improves nausea, vomiting, sedation, and constipation. Then is lopramide. Lopramide is an opioid agonist with no CNS activity except at very high dose, but with marked effect on the intestine. So it has basically faster onset and longer duration of action as compared to the previous drug. And its overdose can obviously result in severe constipation, paralytic ileus, and CNS depression. I hope you all remember what is paralytic ileus. We talked about when we were doing ANF. Okay, then we are going to study bismuth substalicate. So the salicate in this agent inhibits prostaglandin and chloride secretion in the intestine to reduce the liquid content of the stool. It is effective for treatment and prophylaxis of traveler's diarrhea and other form of diarrhea. So what is traveler's diarrhea? Basically when you travel you do develop this condition, right? Okay, so bismuth subsalicate forms a protective coating in the GI tract and has direct antimicrobial activity and it is used to treat H. pyroli infection. So this is a bacterial infection which it treats. Uh, this is used effectively to bind toxins produced by vibrocholia and Escherichia coli. The salicate can be absorbed across the intestine. This produces effect, adverse effects such as stentis. Okay, its adverse effects are really, you know, um, uh, distinguishing. And maybe this would be asked in the exam. Not, not only in this exam, but whenever you want to give exam for pharmacology, maybe this would be highlighted. So you see, tinnitus, we already studied in our last class that tinnitus is the uh, sound which is there in the ear, like T sound, right? Okay, it may also produce black tooth and staining of tongue. So these are the distinguishing features of this drug. Then we have octreotide. Uh, so this is an analog of somatostatin. You would be studying in the next semester more in detail about it. So it is effective for treatment of diarrhea caused by short gut syndrome and dumping syndrome. Uh, let's move to next slide to know what are these. So you see, short gut syndrome is the gut is shorter as compared to the healthy one, right? And the reason could be surgical or maybe half of the gut is irresponsive or uh, maybe they are not even active, you know, stuff like that. Multiple reasons for this. Uh, dumping syndrome. As you can see, the truck is dumping. So it means that evacuation of feces would happen abruptly, like very quickly, okay? So this is called dumping syndrome. Coming back. So it is effective for the treatment of diarrhea caused by shortcut syndrome, where it would be very much quicker. And dumping syndrome, where when you eat, it's passed in the feces, so you don't have time to absorb the nutrients from it, okay? So this is used in cases of severe diarrhea caused by excessive release of GI tract hormones, which is gastrin and vasoactive intestinal polypeptides. It is used in the treatment of neuroendocrine tumors of GI tract. This agent may be administered parenterally. Octiotrite cause, uh, causes mild GI dysfunction and 
formation of gallstones due to alteration of fat absorption. How gallstones are formed, I will discuss that with you. Then we have agents used in inflammatory bowel disease, short form IBD. And here we are going to talk about two conditions. One is ulcer ulcerative colitis and the other one is Crohn's disease. Okay. So if you see, first of all, let's talk about ulcerative colitis. What is that? Ulcerative, you know already that here, whenever I say ulcer of any region, so that means the mucus is uh, withered away. Okay. And now ulcers are being produced, right? When we will talk about Crohn's disease, okay, ulcer ulcerative colitis, basically it happens on one, one, like at one particular place and then it keeps on extending from one place to another, right? In, in, a, uh, in a particular pattern, right? Uh, when we talk about Crohn's disease, first of all, the intestine is, starts to wrap with the fat and different um, parts of the GIT get affected in uh, small, smaller chunks, okay? So basically, uh, for example, if there's a particular path, uh, there's a particular piece of intestine, so at one place you'll have the lesion, then you have will have a gap, and then the other place you'll have the lesion and everything, okay? Uh, so, and then you see the fissures will be there, and then uh, obviously the uh, GIT would be affected by it. So now we'll talk how to deal with it. Okay, so here you have these drugs, which is uh, which are uh, mesalamine, sulfasalazine, ulcersalazine, and baltalazide. So here, this one is 5-amino uh, amino salicylic acid, and this is the active ingredient for the treatment of IBD. is formulated as delayed release microgranules. It's pH sensitive resin, a suspension enema or wax suppository that, uh, that uh, by which you administer it. Okay. All right. So you see the bond is cleaved in the terminal ileum by bacterial enzyme and then uh, basically it, it acts topically. Okay. And then uh, the inflammatory action is being produced. Okay. It's, it's inhibited. Okay. All right. Then we have glucocorticoids and other drugs reacting on the immune system. Here we have prednisone and prednisolone, and they are used most commonly in acute um, exacerbation of the IBD as well as in maintenance therapy. Then we have vidinosonoid. And it is analog of prednisolone. It is, uh, it has low oral bioavailability. So that's why when it has low oral bioavailability, so we uh, we give it in the form of enteric coating or delayed release formulation. Okay. Then its mechanism for action for these drugs involves inhibition of pro-inflammatory cytokines. You will study in the next semester more in depth about it. Then glucocorticoids carry a high incidence of systemic side effects, so their use in maintenance therapy is limited. Up to 60% of patients with IBD are steroid unresponsive or have only a partial response. So glucocorticoids stimulate sodium absorption in the jejunum, ileum, and colon. Um, and then these are used to treat refractory unresponse to unresponsive to other agents. Basically, uh, what is refractory diarrhea? I tell you. Refractory diarrhea is a condition where the diarrhea cannot be treated with any other drug. Okay. So in that condition, when the diarrhea is untreatable with any of the drugs that you have, then you give these glucocorticoids. Okay. All right. Then you have, um, um, then you have azathioprine and six mercaptopurine, and these are basically immune suppressants. Um, 
when I say immune suppressants, it means they are um, they are uh, putting off the immunity system of the body. So these agents are immune suppressants. Their onset of therapeutic action is delayed by several weeks. Therefore, they are not used in acute setting. These agents are used for maintenance and remission of IBD in patients who do not respond well to steroids. These drugs are metabolized by uh, uh, thiopurine S methyltransferase. Again, it's an enzyme for which levels are low in up to 12% of the population in whom dose reduction should be made. The enzyme is absent in 0.3% of the population. So it should be uh, not be administered, okay? And the major side effect, which is like really major, is bone marrow depression, okay? So uh, I'm sure you must have studied in physiology entire role of bone marrow, and I'm sure you don't want it to be depressed. Uh, secondly, one thing that I wanted to mention throughout when I was reading the slide, which is this, you see, when you're using immunosuppressant drugs, okay? So that means you're shutting up your body's immunity system. And when your body's immunity system is being shut up, definitely it's um, then more prone to different infections as well, right? Okay, then we have methotrexate. So it is again an immunosuppressant an XY inhibition of uh, uh, dihydrofolate reductase. It is used to induce and maintain remission in patients with Crohn's disease who do not respond well to steroids. Bone marrow suppression is a major side effect when this drug is used at higher doses. Okay, then we have again um, this particular uh, basically these are all antibodies okay and when we talk about these so these are basically monoclonal antibodies what is monoclonal antibodies so these are basically being cloned okay so here we have inflameximab and then we have adil uh, adlimumab then we have sertolizumab then we have natalizumab. So these are basically monoclonal antibodies which are being administered sub uh, subcutaneously and then they bind and then they neutralize these. Since we have less time, so I'm going to cover up the major aspect of these drugs, okay? Wait a minute, I've got a message from any one of you. Okay. Oh. Uh, Okay, Suba, I will respond to you about it later on. Okay, don't worry. Okay, all right. Then we have, uh, you see, the important aspect of these antibodies is this, that revision or improvement of the uh, symptoms is observed in two thirds of the patients. However, there is a significant loss of response over time. So definitely uh, you need to take care of this thing. Okay, and serious side effects are there. And you see, when I say serious side effects, so there are actually a lot, okay? Which means you're more prone to infections, tuberculosis, and serum sickness, congestive heart failure, and you know, a lot more. So definitely, you need to be very much alert by using these monoclonal antibodies. Okay. <laughs> then we have agents used in the treatment of ir irritable bowel syndrome. Uh, guys, I have to announce one thing here that uh, I have less than a minute okay so if the uh, if the meeting turns off so i want all of you to join that um even if i, if I finish my lecture i want you all to be back so i can talk to you okay all right so this is the last slide uh, which is uh, here uh, in in this particular class of drugs wait a minute okay. so basically uh, now we are going to talk about a drug which is used in the treatment of irritable bowel syndrome, right? And the drug we are talking is 5-H23 antagonist. It blocks receptor on enteric neurons. Enteric means the GIT related neurons, okay? And um, it's approved for diarrhea predominant 